Good morning. Thank you for inviting me to participate today in this historic gathering. It's an honor to be the designated old fart to tell the story of how we got here. It's true, I've been around for a while, but I also see lots of you out there who have paid your dues too. Welcome to all the managers and board leaders. I truly believe that a co-op cannot be successful without a strong and powerful board and a strong and powerful general manager. By powerful, I mean the ability to get things done. Boards and GMs do different things, of course, but both need to be powerful. So here's to a day of building our power to advance the consumer cooperative movement. We are stronger together. My job today is to address some deep questions that every culture ponders. How did we get here and will we survive? Every culture has a creation story but I won't go back quite that far. Let's start in 1844 with the Rochdale pioneers in the Industrial Revolution in England. The Rochdale pioneers were not the first people to cooperate, and they were not the first people to form cooperative businesses, but they were the first to survive. Why, and what lessons can we learn from their survival? First, they developed a set of principles to guide their enterprise based on fairness, equity, and honesty. Those principles have endured, evolved, and still guide our cooperatives today. Second, the pioneers saw that the decisions made by wealthy people were having a bad effect on regular working people. So they determined that capital invested in their cooperative would not make any single person rich, but would create collective wealth that would, be, that would benefit everyone. Think patronage dividends. Third, they took capitalization seriously. It took them years to save up the investment of nearly two weeks' worth of wages per member. Imagine that, two weeks' worth of wages to belong to your cooperative. The capital came in slowly, a penny here, a penny there, but they were determined. Member capital is as critical today as it was then for the growth and expansion of our cooperatives. Fourth, the pioneers set up classrooms and libraries for the education of their members. Public schools didn't exist at the time. Education was something only the wealthy could afford. The pioneers believed that in order to be better business owners and better citizens, they needed to educate themselves and their children. Finally, the pioneers believed in investing in cooperative development using a portion of their cooperative's capital to foster the development of other cooperatives. At that time, only people who owned land had the right to vote, so they set up housing cooperatives so they would be landowners and have the right to vote. They also started a cooperative bank, among other ventures. Through their own efforts, the Rochdale pioneers were finally able to buy pure, unadulterated food because they owned the store. They succeeded in giving their members the means to control their own destiny, democracy, economic fairness, and education. Moving to the United States, cooperative businesses were also taking root here, especially in the areas of agriculture, mutual insurance, and credit unions. Consumer food co-ops began to grow in the 1930s and 40s, many of them started by farmer cooperatives. Others were independent, like the Hanover Consumers Cooperative Society, which is shown here. Today, these co-ops are called the old wave. But survival is not guaranteed. Some say it was a failure of ownership, that many of the co-ops at the time did not engage their members, did not seek to exploit their cooperative advantage, and did not distinguish themselves from other stores. Of the 300 or so cooperatives that formed in this era, only a handful remain including Hanover and the Putney Food Co-op, both of whom are thriving and have representatives here today. The next era of significant food cooperative development was in the late 60s and early 70s. This is sometimes called the second wave, or sometimes hippies with a cash register. Food co-ops grew out of the other movements of the time, civil rights and social justice, the peace movement, the women's movement, and the environmental movement. People were seeking an alternative to business as usual. Food for people, not for profit, was the slogan. We don't know for sure how many co-ops opened in this era, probably somewhere between six and 800. 
Many of the co-ops were collectively run with lots of volunteer labor. Food was sold in trash cans and old refrigerators. Cleanliness was not a priority. Customer service was non-existent and management was often a bad word. As the interest in natural foods grew, more and more competitors opened up cleaner and better run stores. We began to realize that we needed profit after all. But by then, over half of the co-ops had gone out of business. Wholesale cooperatives also grew in this era to serve the retail co-ops and buying clubs. By 1982, there were at least 28 cooperative warehouses around the country. But by 2003, there were only three, and today only one remains. The leaders of the warehouses recognized the challenges that they were facing, including the lack of economy of scale. There were many attempts spanning several years to find ways of working together more effectively. Meetings were held to discuss consolidation, but the leaders were unable to reach agreement on how to work together, and eventually the warehouses either went out of business or were sold. And we never got to find out if we would have achieved the economies of scale anyway. Meanwhile, the managers of the remaining natural foods co-ops had begun attending Consumer Cooperative Management Association, or the CCMA conference, to learn what we could from the old wave. A support network began developing to serve a variety of the needs that food co-ops had, including access to capital, consulting, training and education, information sharing, and networking. A trade magazine called Moving Food, now known as Cooperative Grocer, published news and information. The warehouses developed training programs and retail support services. CDS Consulting Co-op, then known as Cooperative Development Services, developed a database and benchmarking tool, COCOFIST, which stands for Common Cooperative Financial Statements, to help managers identify and share best practices. Regional loan funds pooled capital and made it available to co-ops. The National Consumer Cooperative Bank was formed by an act of Congress, now NCB. The University of Wisconsin Center for Cooperatives developed the Cooperative Management Institute, CMI. This loose network began having an impact, and the 300 or so remaining co-ops began to stabilize and to grow. In 1992, inspired by a keynote speaker at CCMA, a group of managers began to meet together to discuss how they could support each other in the face of increasing competition. They called themselves the Cooperative Grocers Association of the Midwest. These savvy managers were supported by consultants, their warehouse, and others. They focused on developing benchmarks, best practices, peer support, and continuous improvement. As their success grew, more groups started up around the country and more co-ops joined in. In these CGA groups, the managers challenged, inspired, and supported each other. The friendly competition created a chain reaction of improvement and their success fostered an expanded vision. In 1999, six of the regional groups formed the National Cooperative Grocers Association to assist with communication and explore national projects. But the NCGA had no economic engine and no ability to enact powerful programs. In 2003, the NCGA board proposed a reorganization of the CGA system and hired a team of consultants to lead the project. The first step was called Project Elephant Ears, designed to listen to the needs of the managers and their co-ops to ensure that the reorganization would preserve the value and the values of the regional associations. The goals of the, re of the reorganization were to achieve market power, lower cost of goods, more visibility and relevance, and more efficient use of member resources. The resulting organizational plan, called Expanding the Circle of We, was passed by an overwhelmingly positive vote, 89 to 2, in February of 2004. The newly reorganized NCGA was well poised to support the development of general managers and has continued to grow its membership and its services. Later today, we'll learn more about the amazing difference that NCGA has made for all of our co-ops. Remember that co-ops need both strong managers and strong boards to survive and thrive in the long run. So what about cooperative governance? Well, there certainly were boards, but they were not necessarily working on governance. There was little role clarity and the focus was on operations and sometimes politics rather than on leadership and fiduciary responsibility. 
the board track at CCMA, the cooperative warehouse trainings, and cooperative grocer magazine all played a role in promoting improvement in governance. In 2004, the CDS Consulting Co-op developed the first comprehensive program designed to have continuous support for the board of directors built right in. The program was first piloted in, in the Eastern Corridor in 2005 with 24 participating co-ops. Now known as CBUILD, Cooperative Board Leadership Development, over 100 co-ops annually enroll in the CBUILD program. The focus is on a systematic approach to governance that includes empowerment and accountability, strategic leadership, member engagement, and perpetuation of excellence in governance. And now there's a new wave of cooperative development. Since 2005, at least 68 new co-ops have opened stores, and an amazing 80% are still open. It's a very good sign. Those new co-ops include 15 members of NCGA here today. The latest of these is Monadnock Food Co-op, which opened just two weeks ago, April 3rd in Keene, New Hampshire. We don't know how big this wave will become, but we do know that there are at least 150 other groups organizing around the country, maybe as many as 300. Food Co-op Initiative provides these groups a development model, tools, training, networking, and as much support as resources allow. It's too soon to tell how successful this wave will be. I have the opportunity to work with a lot of these groups. Their commitment and passion is inspiring. The work they are undertaking is not easy, but I understand why they are working so hard. If I lived in a community without a food co-op, I would want one, and so would you. So now you know how we got here, at least my version of the story. We have seen how there have been waves of cooperative development followed by deep decline. Will we survive? Well, the answer to that is up to you, the co-op leaders in this room. Will we learn the lessons of our history? Will we have a clear vision? Will we engage our members? Will we support strong management? Will we ensure accountability? Will we invest in cooperative development? Will we use this meeting to launch a new era of consumer food co-op development? Will we work together effectively? Thankfully, we have a strong and capable organization that we own, NCGA, to provide the forum. NCGA is able to aggregate the strength of our local co-ops in ways that none of the previous waves of consumer co-ops had. Driven by the decisions of leaders like you at the local level, NCGA can support and advocate at a national level, making it possible for us to accomplish what previous ways, waves could not. The theme is stronger together. Let's take advantage of our strength. Let's survive. No, let's thrive. Now I want to turn it over to Robin Schrader to tell us more about the work of NCGA today. Robin may be too humble to say so, but I will say that NCGA has been the difference between survival and extinction for many of the co-ops in this room. Our wave of consumer food co-ops owes a tremendous amount of, of gratitude for the vision and the leadership of NCGA to aggregate the power of our local co-ops, to level the playing field, and to help us be stronger together.